Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, a very warm welcome to another session of EMIS Health Live, the new normal. So just a few caveats for you today, just to let you know that the session is being recorded. Clearly, we're being recorded, not you, but we will share that after the event to all delegates. And if you want to share that with your colleagues, you are, of course, very welcome to do so. Please do ask any questions as we go on. Now, I'm very conscious that we always tend to get a flood of questions right at the end. So if you could try to make sure that you ask those questions at the outset or as close to the outset, as close as they come into your head as possible, then you have a better chance of them being answered because we do tend to get a lot of questions. And I think we have about 200 people joining us this evening. Just a reminder, with that in mind, microphone function for you has been switched off. Uh, if my microphone function has been switched off, then you're all sitting watching me move my lips and you're not hearing anything. But I genuinely hope that that is not the case. So please do use that question and answer function if you have any questions or, of course, if you want to communicate with us about anything such as a technical problem. So my name is Dr Sarah Jarvis. I'm a GP. I've been a GP since 1990 and I'm also the clinical director of patient, which of course comprises patient access and patient.info. I'm delighted to say that we're joined today by several other august speakers by Paul Bensley, who's the managing director of Exxon, who's going to be giving us a presentation by Dr Fazana Hussain, who is a user of online consult and who'll be telling us about her experiences and a great deal more, but more of that later. And we have, I'm delighted to say, chairing our question and answer session, Dr. Ed Claude Baker. He is also a GP and he's EMIS Health Clinical Director. In addition to join our question and answer session, we also have Tim East, who's our project manager for online consult. So a packed agenda, lots to get through. Let's get straight on. So what is it? What is total triage? Triage, I think, is one of those words that we really never heard about outside A&E until a few years ago. And yet now, of course, courtesy of the NHS and the total the transformation fund and the funding that's put, been put in by the end of about 2018, about 25 percent of practices uh, were providing some form of online consult or triage for their patients. But we're going much further than this. The Online Consultation Systems Fund was launched in 2017. It was part of the GP general practice forward view. I'm sure we've all had other things on our minds in recent months than thinking about that. But of course, back then there was a mandate from the NHS to practices within the GMS contract to make online consultations available to patients, to make access to medical records available to patients and much more. There's very much been a push to ensure that the patient is at the heart of the service. There is, of course, also a great deal more that's being offered to patients now, for instance, with pharmacies. Pharmacies have increased dramatically their offering for patients and patients, I think, are becoming much more aware that the pharmacist is a great deal more than a dispenser of repeat medications. There's no question that going forward, the NHS will look to make the pharmacy, the community pharmacy, an ever more integral part of the primary healthcare team. We've seen during lockdown that a huge number, huge increase in the number of patients using pharmacies to access medical help for self-limiting conditions. And indeed, we're very, very keen to build on that. And we'll be talking more about that during the course of this session. So this came from the uh, GP con consultation briefing that we had from the NHS to try and encourage practices and, of course, all CCGs have been now been mandated to look at online consultation services. So the NHS checker, the symptom checker at nhs.uk is a sign poster. It does not, of course, submit information to the GP. An online consultation is very different. It's looking at ensuring that the patient is directed appropriately to the most appropriate source of care, whether that's 999 to A&E, whether it's an unscheduled care centre, whether it's 111, or whether they want to submit a form to the GP. And then the GP can determine whether or not they want the patient to be seen. But really importantly, it's also trying to encourage self-care, uh, self-care particularly at the pharmacy. And again, we're going to come back to that later to see some of the other ways in which the NHS is trying to ensure the patients who can self-manage or can be directed safely to the pharmacy are directed there. 
COVID, of course, has changed a great deal. I'm sure you've all seen the statistics. We went from February when 19% of consultations were conducted online or on the telephone to the beginning of April, where 49% at least of consultations were conducted online. Interestingly, in relative terms, there's been a 70% increase in the last month, data that just came out just today about the increase in face-to-face -face consultations, but that has increased from a very, very very low level at the height of the pandemic when a very small proportion of patients were being seen face to face. We know that 90% of GPs say that they do not want to go back to providing a traditional face to face first model and total triage, a digital front door, plays an enormously important part in that. Everybody has to be screened and of course there are different ways of doing it. So again, this comes from the online consultation model from the NHS and the idea is that people can work out, practices can work out how they want to do it. We're going to be hearing from Dr. Hussein who's done both the phased and the big bang approach and her big bang came indeed just after lockdown this year. Some practices, however, have targeted certain groups of patients to use online consultations. So administrative requests, medication requests, long term condition reviews, for instance. Alternatively, you can decide whether you want to move gradually into an online channel. So you might make a certain number of really popular services available, but still allow patients to phone the practice in the way that they have traditionally. The Big Bang is where you have a digital front door. So all patients, for instance, in one of our case studies in Newham in East London, we, they, they designated that all patients would be required to use online consultation to submit a form rather than being able to book an appointment unless they were classified as a vulnerable patient. And that includes, for instance, patients with multimorbidities and frailty and patients with mental health conditions. In doing that, they managed to reduce the number of people, a uh, number of phone calls to the surgery by 20%, despite the fact this was in within two months, despite the fact that they kept those lines open. They dramatically reduced the, the average time to get a response to patients and one in three, in fact, more than one in three, 38 percent of patients who went on to the online consult tool did not need to submit a form because they were provided with so much other information. So here's an example of what we do offer. This is via patient access, but the patient could also access online consult through the practice website. When they go on, they can do a search. They're then provided with symptom based and health promotion videos and leaflets. So we have videos provided by all registered clinicians, registered GPs and all peer reviewed. They will give you a summary of the key features to look out for within two minutes. And indeed, all of those videos are available with closed caption, caption subtitles and auto translate from Google. So patients who don't have English as a first language can get information directly translated from a GP as well. We also have access to all our patient information leaflets at patient.info and importantly, the contact the practice about facility. This can be done. It's now been changed, in fact, just now to contact your practice about your headache. And rather than starting off with the NHS 111's non-specific criteria, the non-specific red flags, everything in online consult is symptom specific so they don't you don't have to trawl through an online uh, consultation form from NHS 111 which tells you that the patient has not fallen from a great height they are not bleeding uncontrollably and you get right down to the bottom of the page and discover that their presenting complaint was toothache so all the red flags are symptom specific and they're presented in the way that we looked at extensively with our user testing. So rather than having to go through 39 screens, we have a tick box with the ability to add none of the above at the end. When it comes into the practice, it is very clearly highlighted what the presenting complaint is. There you can see this patient's got headache. And if you look down there, what you'll see is that all the information, the red flags, for instance, are available right at the top in the home screen. All of this can be integrated straight into EMIS. You can access it. If it comes in through online consult, then it goes straight into a dedicated folder where it is pulled straight into the patient's records. But what you're seeing there on the left hand side with those red flags is that we 
we've also translated all the patient questions that the patient was asked. So that entire page of red flag questions has been translated into medical language so that the GP can access it or the practice nurse can look at it and interpret it immediately and know that the patient does not have an urgent condition. In terms of deployment, we have 733 practices to date, as far as I'm aware. That was last week. We have 42 who are in the process of getting themselves made live, so it may be slightly increased. Those figures are just a week old, but we certainly are seeing an enormous increase. And I'm quite sure that coronavirus had something to, to say about that or something to do about that. But things have moved on enormously and many practices who simply didn't have the time or indeed the resource to move on to a total triage system have now made that leap and having done so the feedback is that many have no intention of moving back again. So we have about 5.5 million patients who could potentially benefit and that doesn't include those 43 patients who are in flight. Just imagine if 38% of those patients did not need to submit a form or contract to the practice or try to get a GP appointment. Only about 25% of the practice of the forms which are submitted to the practice in our most recent case study required a face-to-face -face appointment and indeed of course now you could offer them a telephone uh, sorry a video consultation instead. The vast majority of them could be dealt with very, very quickly on the telephone or by issuing a prescription and sending the patient a text message to inform them that the prescription had been issued, perhaps with background information and with a link to a patient information leaflet. Although again, as I say, throughout online consult, there is at every stage access to those videos and those patient information leaflets, which may account for why we have such a very high proportion of patients who do not end up submitting a form because they've been directed safely elsewhere. And that 38% does not include patients who've been directed to 111 or 999. So they've been directed to self-care or they've been directed to self-help information, which has meant that they no longer feel they need the consultation. So patient access signposting is a natural progression from that, if you like. Patient access signposting is available within your practice uh, or can be available within your practice and is directly accessible from the practice home screen and from the patient consultation screen as well. These are some examples of them. So a smoking cessation referral service that we're doing a pilot with in East London or an NHS minor ailments, which works with the CPCS. So the CPCS, the Community Pharmacy Consultation Service, you can assess the patient for a referral. This all happens within the consultation. Uh, but of course, in addition, the receptionist can do this at the practice. They can either give a tablet to the patient or they can take the patient through it over the telephone. So rather than having to make the make the consultation uh, appointment with the GP or a callback, then the patient can be safely triaged to this without having to come into the surgery. Alternatively, once your practices do open up, then they can complete the form themselves. We have all the safety safeguards, all the clinical safeguards that we have in place, all the information has been written by GPs and has been peer reviewed. It's all based on national guidance. It's the only area where we have a standard, the red flags from the NHS 111 to ensure that the patient is directed out of minor ailments immediately if they have an urgent problem. And you won't be remotely surprised to hear that we have all the questions required for uh, coronavirus screening. In fact, again, this one has now been changed because the NHS uh, criteria has been changed. Having a fever brackets, you feel hot to the touch on your chest and upper back. So that's now been changed as well. If you've gone through that and the patient has not been directed elsewhere, then we have a host. We have about 50 minor ailments where you can simply click on that and you'll get background information. But again, the patient or the receptionist that they're taking the patient through it does not have to make a clinical decision themselves. And this is really important because CPCS is, of course, available through NHS 111s. It should be available through receptionists, through practice receptions, but very, very few practices have taken it up. Or when they have taken it up, the feedback, the number of patients referred to the CPCS to minor ailments have been very low indeed. And we think that this is largely because the receptionists do not feel empowered 
empowered to direct a patient away from the GP on the basis of their clinical symptoms. This, on the other hand, would allow them to do exactly that. And the form can, can be completed in as little as one to two minutes. So this is an example for back pain. So severe uncontrollable pain and electric shock treatment, back pain, which is associated with bladder or bowel incompetence, weakness, new weakness in a limb, etc. They tick that they have none of those. And if they don't, then we will direct them deliberate straight to minor ailments. But we also provide background information. So patient education is provided at every stage. A referral can then be created where it can be sent to the patient. It links them straight into patient access and it gives them information about all the pharmacies in their area which have the CPCS uh, ser service enabled. They then pick a time and date of their choosing, turn up to the, to, the, um, to the pharmacy and the pharmacy can then use this information to link directly into farm outcomes. Uh, which is, of course, the national, apart from in London, the national provider of CPCS. They can include the information. They can fill the form directly because it takes them directly into farm outcomes and they can submit all the forms that they need to get payment. In terms of the clinical provision and the quality of the clinical governance, just to explain to you that this is the process that's gone through. They have we have an author and a peer reviewer for every leaflet, and we also, of course, have updated comments. Uh, so if we get any feedback about new nice guidance, we have a rolling list of patient of topics which need to be updated on the basis of nice guidance. Otherwise, they will be updated regularly every three years, if not sooner. If we have any feedback, then we will, of course, get back to it. In the two and a half years that patient access, uh, that online consult rather, has been running, we have had no more than five clinical queries, none of which were clinical incidents. So after that, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Paul Bensley, who is going to be talking about the role of integrated digital technology telephony. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Right, if you could just move on to the next slide. So uh, we are Exxon and uh, you may have come across us as Surgery Connect, which is actually the name of our product, uh, but we're quite widely known as that. So we provide a cloud telephony system. We try to call it a digital telephone system these days. And I'm just briefly explaining in this first slide what the difference between a cloud telephony system and one that you might have on in the practice might be. So essentially the intelligence has been taken out of the practice and this gives quite a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, location independence. Uh, we can deliver calls to any device, whether it be a mobile, a handset within the practice, um, and that gives a lot of advantages in terms of scalability and the whole system can be managed from the web. And uh, we have an EMIS partner, proud EMIS partner, and therefore we integrate closely with EMIS Web as well um, and the other systems that we don't talk about. Uh, I can't go into the details of Surgery Connect. It, there's a lot of technology behind it. it essentially, it is a contact center system, but uh, since the first was installed in the first practice about seven years ago, uh, we very much focused on the needs of primary care and the feedback from our our customers in that area. And now we have about 700 practices uh, installed with Surgery Connect and uh, we're on track to getting uh, a thousand over the next four or five months. Um, so if you could go on to the next slide, Sarah, thanks. So what's been happening since uh, the COVID-19 uh, change is there's been an explosion in telephone triage um, as as has been mentioned. So before that, a typical practice would ha have a call queue between eight and nine that looks something like that. Uh, so for some reason, it always peaks at four minutes past eight o'clock. Uh, that's they all look fairly similar. That's quite a good one. So the call queue has been largely managed by about nine o'clock, but patients have waited for appointments in that time. Um, but we've seen a huge change in behavior um, over the last three, four months as from the graph at the bottom. So um, we've seen 
a doubling in outbound calls compared with inbound calls. So that matches up with uh, figures that are showing it. We've moved from 3.2 to 7.8 million phone appointments in that period, and that has continued to rise. So in uh, June, that orange one um, is still higher than any month before. So the move to telephone triage is still happening. But actually, we're still getting more inbound calls to practices than outbound calls, so it's not a complete replacement of what's going on. In response to this, we've introduced um, a new product, if you like. It's effectively at Surgery Connect for those who don't wish to wait for Surgery Connect. So by introducing a soft phone, we've allowed GPs to make triage calls from home or from other locations uh, via a soft phone or mobile. Uh, they can choose to display the practice number, for example, uh, so that patients accept the calls. Calls are charged to the practice, so there's not a lot of administration in recharging call costs. And quite importantly, uh, patient numbers don't appear on a personal mobile, for example, so you've got information government security there. Um, the, the calls are recorded and tracked in our data center securely. Um, we also have clicked a call from uh, the patient systems and uh, finally we can even switch a telephone call to a video call mid-flight which uh, uh, for those proportion which we still find from our uh, stats is quite small who wish to move to a video call let's have a look at that is still fairly small but it's a single click switch to video so this has enabled us to respond very quickly to a, a rapid change in behavior from our from our customers new and old. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So what are we doing now next? Um, as I mentioned, we're closely integrated with systems and we see ourselves very much as part of the digital story rather than just an add-on or a phone system. So for example, you can make calls, send text uh, from the patient record within EMIS web here. And uh, there's some examples there. Um, track communications it's it's more than just a more than just telephony um it's uh, what in other industries has been known as omnichannel so it's a we're looking at a place for all types of patient communications in one place and that includes moving patients online where it might be more appropriate so we have the ability for example to send a patient a link while they're waiting in a queue and send them to an online system rather than uh, waiting indefinitely to get through to a receptionist to book an appointment. Um, I think it's important that the integration gives a preferred digital e ecosystem. So we see this as a, a team game that we have one, a GP has one place to go to manage uh, communications with patients and uh, uh, various textual or telephone or video communications and they have a preferred choice as to what works best for them. So it's important to us that we work with as many partners as possible um, to get that choice out there. Patients um, can also get self-care through the telephony interface so uh, they can choose to route their calls elsewhere um, and we can route calls off and there's work we're doing in that area to uh, automatically triage pa patients without them having to get through to the receptionist if they've already uh, dialed their practice. And finally, um, I rushed through, but uh, we, we're also providing a lot of data at scale from um, our customers across multiple practices, PCNs and CCGs to give better analytics on performance across across the board and behavior of patients as they, they call in or we call them. So it's somewhat of a whistle stops tour, but uh, look forward to any questions you may have at the end of it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. It was indeed a whistle stop tour, but packed lots of information for that short <laughs> session. And Paul will still be here, of course, to answer questions at the end. Please don't forget if you have questions, please do submit those questions. It will be a very dull question and answer session if you don't. So it now gives me the most enormous pleasure to move on to my discussion with Dr. Fazana Hussain. Dr. Hussain is a GP at the Project Surgery in East London in East Newham and I am 
very proud and privileged to say that she is also my friend. She has become my friend since actually she took an online consult. She's been a huge advocate of it and it's been an absolute pleasure. It was always a pleasure and I always knew she was special, but ladies and gentlemen, this is not just any doctor. This is the general practice face of the 72nd anniversary of the NHS. And there is Fazana standing in front of her photograph Oh, 40 feet high in Piccadilly Circus just a couple of weeks ago. So Fazana is an extraordinary GP. She has done the most amazing things with her practice. And I think it's fair to say she is a real role model. She does not have the easiest of practices. It is a deprived area. There is a very high proportion of patients who don't have English as a first language. Uh, and yet, despite that, she is always smiling and she never, ever appears to have a, a crossword or even a frustrated word. So, Fazana, it's now. I'm going to turn this off, stop sharing my screen because I should have had a discussion with her. And I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to turn over to her. And there she is, Fazana. <laughs> I hope you're blushing. <laughs> I am. What an introduction. Thank you so much. I don't know what to say. Thank you. Well, you can thank me, although you don't need to because it's all true, by telling our delegates something about your experience. So I was just going to start on, start off with just a little bit about um, your journey with online consults. So tell me about how you were using it before COVID. Sure, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and um, so I'm at the Project Surgery and we have 5,000 patients and I'm a single-handed GP supported by my three salary doctors. And uh, we have had EMIS online uh, triage and the facility to do this from January 2019. And we wanted to use it and we were doing that sort of slow targeted approach. And we did find that particularly for a lot of non-clinical problems like the um, administrative uh, requests for letters and sick certificates. Um, we, we were using it under 5% of our consultations were coming through online. Um, and we kept thinking, we'll do it, it looks good, it's fine, there's always tomorrow. And then COVID came, didn't it? And then COVID came and we implemented total, big bang, total online triage within three days. Um, and there were some really, I think, important reasons for why. And I think if anybody listening in is thinking about doing this, try and work out what your why is. So we had two very important reasons. One was that we were finding, as many practices across the country have found, that people thought general practice was closed to non-COVID problems. And um, we've already seen in the stats that cancer um, diagnosis rates have gone down, uh, that heart attacks compared to this time last year were not presenting at casualty. So it's really important to me that our patients knew that we were there for them for everything, non-COVID problems. And of course, online gave that ability, that ability for our patients to access us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If they wanted to put in a query at two in the morning, they could. And we would pick that up between eight and six thirty. And, um, and and we did find that that happened, that lots of non-COVID queries were coming through. So I felt safe as a doctor. I felt that I was still able to offer the, the general practice service that my community served. The second thing was um, that uh, sadly Newham has had a lot of COVID deaths. We've been one of the highest areas sadly affected by COVID and we know that a lot of um, BAME people are, are adversely affected. 80% of my staff are BAME so it was really important for me as their employer and on a humane level to make sure that we cut that face-to-face -face time down as much as we could. I have five uh, part-time receptionists, two of whom are on maternity leave and two of whom were isolating. So I had one receptionist standing and we thought, actually, if anything happens to poor old Emma, then we're going to close. And online triage gives you the ability to actually for your patients to have full access direct to the GP without that receptionist being on, on the desk. So online has actually helped me not 
you know, breach my contract, keep her surgery open, but actually increase the access rather than eight till 6.30 for us to, to know that we're there for our, our patients all the time. And we found that, um, you know, uh, we've, you know, we've all been mums when mine were little, you know, it's always two in the morning when the little one's crying and you're not sure whether they're sick or not. Um, and, you know, you can, we can see that some of those um, queries are coming in at night time and, and we're possibly, possibly um, avoiding those people going to casualty. So it's had so many benefits, benefits for staff, benefits for our patients, increasing access. And uh, we may, I mean, it's just anecdotal, but we may actually be reducing a &E attendance as well, helping the NHS as a whole. Fantastic. Wow. So can you tell me about the practicalities of changing it over? How did you inform your patients? What happened? Yeah, so here's where um, it's the my reception team who have um, to, to take the credit. I just basically said, let's do this. Um, it was it was great that um, our clinicians were on board as well. But it, it was the reception team who, when people were asking for telephone appointments, we, we were on telephones before uh, we had a telephone first model, were actually helping explain the price because change is hard for all of us. Change is hard for patients, change is hard for practice staff it's not easy and it was reception who were able to if people needed a bit of help filling in the form they, they also did that and actually my reception team's feedback was people are not stupid they were only needing help that once and they said to me this is so much better than answering phone calls, um, you know, with patients. And actually, we we find that our work is more meaningful to us. It's more helpful. And that hasn't been for the majority of people. And, and as you said, I'm working in an area where English is not the first language for the majority of the patients. What I found was and the feedback we've had is because the patients have their time even on a telephone consultation they're still working on my time they've got those few minutes a 10 past nine appointment a 9 30 appointment online just takes that whole rigidity of appointments away so even if somebody's first language is not english they've got time um often they have got a family member i've had an eastern european lady say to me oh actually i prefer this to telephones because i've got a translate Thing on my phone and and it, it, so please can you actually communicate that way um, so language hasn't been the issue that I thought it would be great thank you very positive and of course very important um, what about the surgery team how do they feel about it so the surgery team said to me because we were thinking about what we we're, we're going to do going forward um, they don't want to go back my 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 Doctors are really happy. I have a number of salary doctors, uh, many who are uh, mums with young children. And one of the things that they found most useful is that flexibility uh, that actually they can do their consultations and it's not a set appointment time. And yeah. the other thing that we noticed, um, Sarah, is how much you know, we, we talk a lot about um, well-being of staff and, and how you know a lot of GPs are rightly suffering from burnout. And one of the things that my salary GP fed back to me was that because it's online and it's not a patient in front of her, if she wants to go and talk to somebody or actually she wants to be in the same room as somebody or another GP, that's fine. And we weren't even doing that on the phone. And that peer support, which undoubtedly enhances care because there's two brains thinking about what would you do with this, um, is just a, a sort of a consequence that we haven't even thought of that, that was not available face to face or on the phone. So I think it's incredible increased well-being for my, my staff, but it's also increased clinical care because there's a bit more time for discussion, which people used to say to me, you know, we can't do one phase. We're so busy seeing our patients. It's actually hard to get time to discuss anything. And just to top it all off, we've managed to increase our number of appointments by 20 percent. So um, because a lot of online consultations are quicker, not all of them, but some are quicker, we are closing about 25 to 30 percent online. That's not even going to a telephone. And because of that, we now do an extra five contacts. So. Um, when I have two doctors and we're offering 100 appointments a day uh, compared to 80 a day. So that's great news for me as an employer, great news for my patients because actually it's access that is quite hard for my patients to, you know, to get that appointment. 
That's really interesting because that, that figure that marries almost exactly with the figures that we've had from one of our most recent case studies where previously they were seeing 18 patients. They had 18 patient contacts with face-to-face uh, -face consultations and phone calls and now they could deal with 30 forms and that included getting back to the patient dealing with the form. So, so a very, very, very similar figure. How interesting. Okay, fantastic. Now you were also using Surgery Connect before. Um, why did you choose them? So Surgery Connect I changed to because it's got some great facilities. So um, we've been telephone first for seven years and I love the fact that it's um, all recorded. Um, so that's very, very helpful, um, <clears throat> not just medical legally, which has been useful, but also as a learning exercise. And so we're a training practice, so great for our, our, our trainee doctors. Um, great for patients we had um we had a patient complain i think she was most upset and had felt that um the doctor had denied her a referral and actually the doctor didn't feel that so we actually played it back to her and she was able to acknowledge that she was just really upset that day so that that was helpful it was an interesting way to deal with it um, and there's also uh, really great stats. So we get uh, monthly reports um, that uh, come in as a package so we can actually see when our peaks are. And of course, going online, um, you know, 18 years as a GP and I couldn't do anything about on a Monday morning. I just knew that my patients were waiting 30 minutes. You know, every PPG meeting was the same as that. I know I don't know what to do. And that's just gone down because there's no need to fight in at 8.30 ringing because so many of us um, are, are, are going in online. The phone lines are so much quieter. So it's marrying in quite nicely. Um, uh, you know, my, my next challenge to myself and my network is because I'm a clinical director, is how we spread this good practice across the seven practices. So it's not just my 5,000, but 67,000 residents that can benefit from this. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. So. Just touching on Surgery Connect again, how did it help in your switch or what role did it play in the success of your switch to total triage? So it's really great that so the model we use is that people come in online unless they're vulnerable um, or if they're just having difficulty using it. I mean, there is still the telephone appointment available, uh, but because um, I would say if your reception team can just, um, just help and aid, uh, then that's really useful. So we, we have most people coming in online and then um, if we can't understand the call, can't deal with it, then we will we will phone them and, and we're using the Surgery Connect for that. And again, with the recording and the safety, um, you know, I, I don't think I would use any other, the, the, model, yeah. the other provider I've done for seven, yeah, seven years. Now, one of the things that certainly I've heard a lot from GPs um, since they we first mooted the idea of a sort of digital front door is this idea of oh, well, patient, it'll just be another way for patients to get hold of us. So the demand is going to go up. It's a, it's a you know limitless demand. There's no set, you know, there's no ceiling on the number of forms people can submit in the way that there is the number of telephone calls that you can take. What's your experience of that? So that was a fear. I have to say that was a real fear for me. <clears throat> and that's a huge challenge I've had from the network. It just hasn't been our experience. It, it just hasn't been that. We, we haven't reached 100 a day, which is the capacity we can give, and we haven't reached that. And I think there is something about, um, as you were saying, a number of people who are, once they've um, looked at the, the sites that they're not needing to submit. But also, I think there is something about when people know that they can access their GP, they don't need to make that appointment just in case. Uh, because there is the just in case, I mean, and it's quite a valid thing because you know, let me make an appointment for two weeks time just in case because I might not get it otherwise. And actually that's just gone, you know, if if they know that and actually not that, but I don't come in going in the morning with, you know, 85 people having uh, done an online consult at two in the morning. That's not been our experience. And I'm working in an area where there is, you know, quite low levels of self-care and low levels of health literacy. Despite that, that hasn't been the case at all and we've been doing this through COVID and even now when we're busier it still hasn't been the case. Okay that's really helpful thank you. Now we do have one form for general health queries and uh, clearly we encourage 
as many people as possible what it would be ideal if as many people as possible use the symptom based forms so that they can get all the symptom based red flags rather than having general one how do you stop people from from doing that or how do you encourage them to move towards the the symptom based forms so we have seen uh, because we're starting off we have seen as you say the majority use general health query and again it's uh, for me it's about working with our patients and, and, and not telling them off so it's about well actually if you've got a, a a period problem then it might be easier for you to use that particular form because the questions might direct you and help you so this is for, for us about working together with our patients to say actually we need to ask you more questions and if you feel that this in then it might actually help you and just that conversation is very easy and we've noticed that slowly slowly the number of general health queries is going going down because people don't know any different it's not that they don't want to it's just mm. about learning together really sure okay and finally your top tips for engaging your patients I think it's a great idea to tell people why. So um, I think that the big win has been that um, said, you know, we can actually get more of you to contact us if we, if we do this. Um, the second thing in engaging patients is there is definitely something very liberating about knowing that you can contact your GP, your and we've you know had an AMP as well, so your clinicians 24 seven. I think that's transformational in the way that, you know, general practice is to be able to contact. Um, and um, thirdly that, you know, there is something about respecting time. If I think about how people used to come into my, so this is how it used to go face to face. You queue for about five minutes trying to get to the reception line, then you see the Only five? Can <laughs> I work in your practice? <laughs> And then after you've wasted that five minutes, then you're sitting in the waiting room, you know, with a really boring magazine for another 15 minutes. That's if the doctor's running on time. And then you finally get in for your 10 minutes. And before you know it, your whole morning has gone. And this way, we, we're just respecting time. I think in a time where if I want to order a takeaway, I can go online and just order a takeaway. I don't need to go all the way down to the takeaway and wait there. I, I just think it, it's a real respecter of people people's time, whether you're working, whether you're a young mum, whether you've got caring responsibilities. And um, I think patients have loved that most, you know, they're like, oh, can you can you send my oh, is, is, can you and I'll just text them and, you know, we'll send it the prescription. And I've had really good feedback like that was so painless. That was so simple, yeah. you know, and I think those are the real top tips. And I would say it's a different way of working. That's always a challenge. So bear with it. Both sides will make a few mistakes and we'll we'll learn to it together. Go for it. OK, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Pazana Hussain. But don't go away because I believe we're now going to pass over to Ed, who's going to take us through some questions. Good evening and um, uh, thank you very much indeed, Sarah, Fazana and Paul for such an informative um, discussion telling us about um, online consult patient signposting and um, very importantly your your journey um, for Zana um, through online consulting and, and total triage and Paul um, through the digital telephony um, uh, evolutions that have been um, happening. So I'm, I'm going to give Sarah and Fazana a little break um, from the questions and and go to um, Tim East, who is our product manager uh, for online consult, Hello. and then talk a little bit to Paul after that about some of the telephony. So, um, so everyone, I, I'm a GP. I'm a practicing GP in Leicestershire. I, I spend two days a week doing that, and and three days a week as a clinical director with Emus Health, um, and. Uh, that for me is a, is a huge career privilege. Um, when asked, I say I say it's the the biggest chance of my career to help the most people because if we get um, the functionality right in the Emis Group products, we can really help our patients and all the people who are working um, in in healthcare to to provide a better experience. Um, so I'm very fortunate to work with Tim, who, who's our, our product manager for this. Um, for the online consult and um, 
you know, I'm not afraid to ask Tim for a few more enhancements to the product and always, always driving with it with a clinical angle. So, you know, this is a very fast moving um, area of healthcare, Tim, especially due to COVID, that's really accelerated things. So I thought it'd be nice just to talk about a few things that are coming up on the roadmap, um, as it's called, which for everyone who hasn't heard of a roadmap, that is uh, what is going to be developed next in the product to in enhance it um, and improve the experience for everyone. So one of the things we've been waiting for is the ability to up upload an image. Um, so that could be sent with a form. Tell us tell us about that, Tim. What's what's going to be happening there? Yeah, so the image upload um, basically gives the capability for the for the patient to upload uh, an image from their mobile phone or uh, desktop. Um, we tend to get around six out of ten form submissions to a mobile phone. Um, so a bit like with um, various other apps, you have the ability to um, get to a point in an ap application, um, either take a picture or uh, browse your camera roll and insert that image um, into the form submission. So that's what we've uh, we've been looking at. Um, so we're look looking at uh, providing that capability and that will uh, be available in the uh, a number of the forms where it's relevant um, and we'll place it in the in the in the um, sort of location, the, the position of, of the form. Uh, so it makes sense and it, and it flows when the uh, patient's filling out the form. And then when we're presenting it, um, we'll be presenting it in, in the PDF file that gets sent down to the clinical system. Uh, so again, it will be placed in the relevant position uh, of the form. And then at the end, um, obviously the, there's quite a lot in terms of making sure it's safe, secure, uh, encrypted and also the, the the resolution is right so when you actually receive it on the screen it's uh, you know you can you can make out the image so that's going to be an interesting one which um, we'll we'll be doing uh, shortly um, with online consult you also have the ability to create your own forms and I think there was a question on, on the uh, Q&A about that so yes you can create your own forms and you'll be able to drop that component um, into a topic that you create um, so you can use that within your practice for specific reasons uh, that you decide. Um, and again, the unique thing with our platform is that the forms can be shared across um, we call organisation groups. So that could be a PCN, it could be uh, a hub, it could be just a collection of practices. Um, so it, it can be created once and then shared across uh, across your practice. So yeah, we're looking forward to bringing bring that to fruition really. Thank you, um, Tim, that, that's very helpful. So uh, those of us who, who work in the, um, in, the, in the practice receive these forms, um, hopefully through uh, workflow, and um, these will um, come in uh, through into the special online triage box. There are some improvements that are going to happen to to the workflow experience soon. That's on the roadmap. Tell us a little bit about that. What's coming in that space? Yeah, so that's where we've been looking at um, where practices maybe have both platforms enabled. So they have patient access enabled, <clears throat> which is great because it already validates the, pa the patient and comes into EMIS web with the patient details through. Um, we know some practices also have the website enabled as a, a backup and a, an alternative way of, of a form submission. Um, there is a challenge with that in EMIS web, so it comes into two locations. So the improvement would be streamlining it. So you're just dealing it with it in one place, uh, one folder in the workflow manager. Um, so that'll make it easier. The, the processing of the form uh, obviously looking in one place rather than two. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that hopefully uh, that'll improve the process in the practice and make it um, a lot more streamlined. That's great. Um, with this uh, area of work, practices will be very interested in um, the, the numbers uh, of, of what's been happening. Um, the, the so as we call it, the analytics um, of the of the experience, how many forms go this way or, or get submitted, where they're submitted from, what topics are being used. Tell us a bit a little bit about the um, EMISX analytics and the 
uh, the offering there that we're that we're developing. Yeah, so the challenge at the moment with um, analytics for online consult um, is that we've got we've got data in different places, and, and that's quite common with with systems, especially when there's um, interfaces between them. Um, so currently, you can receive you, you've got reporting with online consult for your form submissions um, and details around that. Um, your outcomes. Uh, which is once the forms come into your practice and you've re maybe recorded an outcome uh, in the clinical system, that data is held within EMIS web. Uh, and then data such as um, page views, forms that have been clicked, um, red flags that have been clicked. Um, we've provided a, an integration into Google Analytics, which will give you that. So you can see the data is actually in three, three different areas. Um, Moving forward, um, we've got our uh, EMIS um, X analytics platform um, and that's where that will come into its own really, where we'll be able to feed that data feeds from different areas into one platform and then be able to present that information uh, in, a, in a consolidated view. Um, and that will really help for bringing that, those data metrics together and seeing exactly what's happening at your practice level. Um, and then that, that'll be widened out or has the ability to be widened out, not just for online consult, but vid, for video consult and you know all these digital services that the practice is, is providing um, so that you're, you know, you've got a clear picture of the engagement that's happening and the transactions that are happening in your practice. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, Tim. That, that's that's very helpful. Um, Paul, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the sort of t telephony, and this this all just sounds amazing. I can remember uh, not so long ago um, sitting in partnership meetings with the practice manager saying, you know, I think we're going to have to increase from five lines to six doctors. Um, and uh, we'd we'd buy another bit of copper that would come into the building and uh, and a couple of more extensions. But but this is just amazing. Um, some of the new cloud based telephony that that's happening. And of course, um, COVID has has really uh, thrust us into the ability to remote work, which hasn't been happening so much. Um, and this the the concept of of soft phone has been um, a, a new advent for, for many GPs and their practices. Um, and I, I had a, you know, I've been very fortunate that you've let me have a, a look and and see or, of this of this product. So for for those who who haven't um, you know got been introduced yet to the soft phone functionality, how easy is it to get hold of, and and how easy is it to set up for for users? Yes, Edward. Well. I hope you found that it was pretty easy for, um, so for yourself. Uh, the soft phone lives in a browser, so essentially it is a web page with a telephone on it. Uh, so once you've passed the required security so that you can log in and that can be a, a single sign on from the clinical system or a standalone login, you have access to make calls and those calls will appear as though you were making them from the practice. So the patient will see the practice number presented. Uh, they will be logged accordingly in the um, central database. And I think that's quite interesting from the analytics point that Tim was making. Uh, there is a lot of work I think to be done in seeing how patient contacts are being made most efficiently, both in terms of patients calling into practices and also in being called to make sure that those are happening in the best possible way, in the most efficient way uh, and in the ways that suit the patient best. So a patient may wish to go online or they, we may wish to persuade them to go online, uh, but at the same time it's a preference and I think that's the important thing is that everybody should have a preference as to how they are contacted and how they will make contact uh, when they need to seek clinical help. So yes, simple. Great. You can have, Thank you. You can have one in a few minutes. OK, that, that's good. Um, one of the things that we experience um, as, as practicing doctors is when you're in a um, telephone consultation or triage with a patient and you realize that you, you really want to convert this to a video call, there's then a, um, 
a, a process that might happen, which may be brief or slightly longer, depending on which route you're taking um, to convert to a, to a video uh, consultation. You, you were mentioning that you can convert some of your calls straight into to video calls. Tell us tell us about that and, and how 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 that experience is for, for the um, for the clinician and and the patient. Yes, I think from our perspective, it seemed to make sense that you're when you will benefit from a video call that we can do it in the same environment as you've made the phone call. So we know that a particular patient is on a mobile um, and therefore we can send them a message inviting them to a video call and they will get a secure one that one time link to engage in that video call, which will then replace the phone call straight away. So it's keeping it all within the same environment. Uh, if you're recording the phone call, then you can go on to record the audio part of the video call. We don't currently record the video um, and that will all be a single transaction. So the idea is to make it as smooth as possible and the same goes for sending them a text message uh, all to happen within the same communication platform. Great, thank thank you very much indeed, Paul. That that's very helpful, Sarah. We've got some um, uh, question or two that have come through on the on the published um, on the published Q and A, and one one's a fairly specific one. And let let me take you through that if that's okay. For this um, CPCS, does this go through one one one? So the the pharmacist would be paid. Right, so it doesn't go through CP uh, through 111, but the pharmacist is paid uh, if they're part of one of the pilots. So the idea is that currently there is a national 111 service for CPCS, which allows pharmacists to be paid. Or alternatively, there are if you have a pilot in your practice, then your reception can direct a patient to CPCS and that way the patient, the uh, pharmacist will be paid in exactly the same way. And again, with farm outcomes, this is all done through farm outcomes. So everything goes seamlessly into the pharmacist through farm outcomes from patient access and the pharmacist can then submit the form at the same time. Thank you. Um, and Sarah, there's another question here, which which relates really to that theme that um, practices are wonder, uh, you know, worried that this is a sort of new work and additional work and uh, unlimited unlimited access to me. Um, and and the question really is along the theme of what percentage of online consultation contacts um, are dealt with through that experience rather than needing to be converted into a telephone call or face to face. So about 38% uh, 37, 38 of people who go on to online consult do not submit a form at all. So that's getting rid of 38% at the start. And of those, about 25% uh, need a of those that remain, of the other two thirds that remain, about 25% of patients need a face to face. So that's one quarter of two thirds, uh, which yeah. is about 15% of people who go on to online consult need a face to face. Of the others, uh, there is, I think, an, a fairly even split between those who need a phone call follow-up and those who, who just get a text or something dealt with. Yeah. Um, is that your experience, Fazana, about yes. approximately? Yes, in fact, if anything, Sarah, I mean, I know I'm working in, um, my, my practice is quite young, so we've only got 3% over 65, but we have gone down to under 10% needing face-to-face. -face. Oh. We've got about 30% that is closed online, the rest telephone, um, uh, some not that many videos um some going to video but but the face to face is as low as that thank you and sarah one thing i just wanted to cover with you if if that's okay is um at the beginning of at the beginning of lockdown you know patients were no longer able to come into their practice so registering for for patient access or patient yeah. patient facing services provider was became more difficult but but really to to use the online consulting platform we would prefer them to do that through patient yeah. access because the 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 record is then matched to the form and it goes straight in matched to the patient in workflow there's been some work that's been going on about um, ways that patients can register for patient access remotely. T tell us about that and resources that may follow. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you for bringing that up, Ed. I think it is really important. So many things have changed since online con consult and indeed um, we're in the process of becoming part of the NHS login, but unfortunately that was all rather put on hold as a result of coronavirus. However, um, if you go on to EMIS now, in fact, we'll send it, I think I, I will ask Fern to send out a link after this to all our delegates. Uh, then there is a guidance pack, so you can just go onto the guidance pack down the bottom. You can just download it, it says view our full guide here. You can verify 
my patients remotely. Um, of course, people can you can you can um, vouch for patients, but in addition, if you can't vouch for the patient, as may often be the case, perhaps more in London than it is in rural areas where the turnover of patient is very low, there are all the tips that you need to know about the vouching method. And there's also an, uh, a, an article on the patient access website that patients can view and that will give them guidance about how they can register um, with patient access. And I think what Thank we'll you. do is we'll send that out to everybody after the meeting. Thank you. And I'm, ju I'm just going to squ squeeze one more question in for Fazana, if that's OK, before we close this Q&A session. Um, Fazana, some you have know, done some amazing work and and really led this led this space, uh, you know, of online consulting. And thank you very much for doing that. Um, an interesting idea that the, using the PPG, just briefly, a couple of tips on on how could practices use their engage their PP, PPG to um, improve the experience and and get patients to take it up. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. So um, a lot of this, um, uh, you know, pr prior to COVID, um, the, the, the plan was as direct feedback from the PPG. I, I would ask PPG, you know, one question, you know, how's the access now? Because in my own practice for years, it was, well, I wait 30 minutes to try and get an appointment. Um, and that that was it for about 10 years. You know, I wait 30 minutes to get an appointment and then the receptionist says, or the appointments have gone um, and you know that is soul destroying for any patient and soul destroying for any receptionist uh, and not great news for any doctor so um, if you listen to your PPG and then they can help you so those that are actually able to use uh, the online they can say you know I order my shopping online on Tesco and I can't do it have you tried this and they become advocates for you and we haven't actually had our patients um, um, enable people we've got receptionists to do, but there's no reason we couldn't. There's no reason that patients could, couldn't help. But I think it's that uh, amazing difference that access could, can make. That's been our experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's been really in, inspiring and, and an extra way to approach this. So thank you. Um, we're going to draw this event to a close now um, and uh, end the Q&A. So I would like to particularly thank our, our presenters, um, Fazana Hussein, uh, Sarah Jarvis, Paul Bensley and Tim East um, for their contribution this evening. Thank you very much indeed. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking your time out this evening to join us for this event. Um, we at EMIS Health will look forward to seeing you hopefully for some more sessions for the rest of this week and next week. Um, remember that a um, post event email will go out with some of the content, um, re a recording from today and some frequently asked questions. So thank you once again for joining us this evening. Good evening.